Okay, we'll save the question section to the uh, round table uh, discussion part. Okay, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Raju Kushalapati. Professor uh, Kushalapati is the uh, Paul C. Carbo Professor of Genetics and Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and was the uh, first scientific director of the Harvard Medical School and Partners Healthcare Center for Genetics and Genomics. Professor Raju uh, uh, Kuchalapati received his PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign and did his postdoc at Yale University. He's been working uh, as a faculty at the uh, Princeton University, University of Illinois College of Medicine, at Albert Einstein College, and right now he is the uh, working at Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, he contributed to uh, several areas of research in genetics and genomics. He was a part of the Human Genome Program and the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, Program. He served on the editorial board of the New England Journal of Medicine and was editor-in-chief of the Prime Journal Genomics. He is a fellow of American Association for the Advancement of Science and also a uh, member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Kushalapati was a member of the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical, bioethical Issues during the Obama administration. He also served as an advisor to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services for reimbursement of laboratory developed tests. He also co-founded several biotech companies uh, based on the research results generated in his research lab. And he has been also an active promoter of precision medicine in globally, particularly in China, and organizing, he's the co-chair of the uh, International Cancer Precision Medicine Conference uh, in China that has been running for several years in a row already. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Professor Kushalapati to share us his visions on genetics in medicine. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here. And uh, I'm uh, very delighted uh, by this uh, new collaboration between the uh, uh, you know, Suzanne Ba and the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, it is indeed a momentous occasion, and I'm uh, very pleased to have the opportunity to be uh, one of the members of this inaugural series of uh, talks. Uh, so thank you very much. <clears throat> so uh, I also want to uh, mention several things, actually, many of you may or may not recognize that this is the 70th anniversary of the discovery of the structure of DNA. And uh, it's also the 30th anniversary of the completion of the full human genome sequence that we published in 2003. And, uh, and you also talk about, uh, you know, Bruce already mentioned uh, the President Obama. I had the pleasure of being an advisor to President Obama during his tenure at the White House. And uh, one of those aspects, uh, you know, while he was uh, uh, the President of the United States, was uh, his commitment to precision medicine. And this is a picture that was uh, taken at the White House. And the very interesting thing is that it, they didn't have a, a, a structure of the DNA they had to run to the NIH to find this, this model of DNA in Francis Collins's office, who was the director of the NIH at that time, had to run back to the White House to put him in front of, you know, for, to take this picture. But in any case, what is this uh, precision medicine or personalized medicine, where does it come from? And um, it really starts actually in 1990, when in the United States, 
the National Institute of Health, together with the Department of Energy, started a new program to try to sequence the human genome for the first time in the history of, 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 of entire human history. At the time that this program was started, it wasn't clear how, what is going to be the technology that's going to be used to sequence the human genome, how long it was going to take to sequence the human genome, and how much money it's going to cost to sequence the human genome. Nevertheless, those two organizations were bold enough to start a, a completely new program to try to find and develop the technology to be able to sequence the human genome. And uh, to start the program, they wanted to have somebody who is very distinguished to lead the program. And uh, they asked Jim Watson, who is the co-discoverer of the structure of the DNA, to be the head of that program. And there, at that time, there were not too many people who were thinking about either human genome mapping or sequencing. And I had the privilege of being one of those. And I was recruited, you know, along with many others, to be a part of the Human Genome Project, for which I'm very proud of. So that program started in 1990. Uh, you know, after nearly 10 years of uh, effort with uh, a large number of people initially from the United States, from later on from many parts of the world, including China, you know, was involved in uh, sequencing the human genome. And uh, that results from those initial works was published in 2001. What is really interesting about this aspect, as I mentioned to you, is in 1990, we didn't know how much money it was going to cost to sequence the human genome. and. Uh, so when all the money was added up, it turned out that it cost 2.5 billion US dollars to single, sequence a single human genome. So one of the excitements about, you know, after this initial sequencing was, you know, the desire by many people to try to, you know, develop technologies to be able to sequence the human genomes, not of just one, but many people. And uh, so there was a challenge that was, uh, you know, established by uh, the National Institutes of Health in the United States, and many companies started, you know, essentially competing in this uh, process. And, uh, and all of you know that, you know, one of the companies in the United States, Illumina, and a company here, Beijing Genomics, really took part in this effort. And through these uh, last 20 years, the technologies for sequencing have dramatically changed. And that single sequence, you know, that cost $2.5 billion in 2000, now costs less than $1,000. And as a result of that, now thousands and hundreds of thousands of human genomes have now been sequenced. And uh, so what, how can we use all of this information to be able to improve the health of uh, the human populations. And uh, that aspect of utilizing genetics and genomics to be able to manage the health is what is referred to as the precision medicine. And one could think about how me precision medicine can be used, you know, in improving the health of uh, populations. Here it shows uh, how now it is possible to be able to assess whether you know, married couples, when they're thinking about having children, whether they are likely to have a healthy baby. It's very important, certainly in this part of the world where the number of children, you know, in each family is relatively limited, to be able to have healthy babies. The second thing is that it turns out that women who become pregnant after the age of 35 have a higher probability of having children with the chromosome abnormalities such as Down syndrome. And uh, now, as I'll show you in a, in a minute, it is now possible to be able to use this novel technologies to be able to do non-invasive prenatal diagnosis. And it also turns out that in China, about 6% of the newborns, of a million or so newborns that are born every year in this country, about 6% of them have some kinds of genetic abnormalities when they're born. In many cases, we don't know exactly what that you know, genetic abnormality is, 
and how to treat them. An important aspect is being able to do the diagnosis and these new sequencing technologies are now enabling us to be able to diagnose these childhood disorders. And finally, it also turns out that uh, these kinds of technologies are playing a very important role in trying to choose the right type of medicine for the right kinds of patients in cancer, and some of which that uh, Bruce have uh, alluded to. So I'll give you some examples of how these are. The first question is to be able to how, how do you keep, keep, keep people healthy? And uh, you know, many people think that uh, you, know, you could keep, keep uh, populations healthy by eating healthy, good food, and, uh, and doing exercise would be able to help everybody. Eating good food and you know, doing exercise are important, but it turns out there are other types of you know, factors, especially genetic factors that are very important. And uh, so I want to show you an example that genetics plays a very important role in virtually all types of disease. How do we know this? And one of the ways that, uh, you know, we could find out the role of genetics is to study uh, twins. And as all of you know, there are two types of uh, twins. One are identical twins. It means that they have shared exactly the same genetic sequence. And uh, the second class are fraternal twins. They're just like siblings, right? And uh, this is a picture of uh, actually a place in, call, in the United States called Twinsville, Ohio, where all of these uh, twins gather every year and a large number of researchers gather around to try to do, you know, uh, these twin uh, studies. So using these twin studies, then you can do uh, a variety of different types of questions. So one of the aspects that you could, for example, is to look at uh, obesity and diabetes. Obesity and diabetes are, you know, affect a large population around the world. About in the United States, about 5% of the people have, you know, diagnosed with obesity and diabetes, and the cost of taking care of these patients is very significant. So now, does uh, genetics play a role in obesity? And uh, so here's what one could ask, say, what is the you know, probability that any one of us, for example, would be able to develop obesity or diabetes when you get older? And that is the population incidence, and that uh, turns out to be about four to five percent. If a sibling has the diabetes, and it turns out that the probability uh, that you, you know, the other sib, sib would also be able to develop diabetes is about 30 percent. And of course, siblings, you know, the probability of sharing any genetic trait between two you know, siblings is about 50%. If it turns out, however, if, there are a, if there's a twins that are identical twins, if one of them is diagnosed with obesity and diabetes, the probability that the second person would be able to develop diabetes is 90%. And uh, so what obviously it is very clear from these types of studies that genetics plays a very important role. I just gave you an example of obesity and diabetes, but virtually every common disease that is afflicting the populations around the world have these types of studies have been done. And virtually all of those have a genetic basis for them. The other thing that, that's also important turns out to be longevity. How long do we live? All of us want to live for a very long period of time and want to have a healthy and long life. And it turns out that if uh, your sibling you know, lives to be 100, the probability that you will also live to be 100 increases by, by a factor of six. Really remarkable. So you all wish that your brothers or sisters you know, live to be 100. So you can also live to be 100 years old. Right? So genetics is not the only component that's important. Of course, as I mentioned, environment also plays a very important role. But genetics also plays a very important role in other types of things. There are large numbers of drugs that are being developed for a variety of types of disorders. And here's an example of drugs that have been developed for rheumatoid arthritis. And many of these drugs that have been developed 
or against particular types of uh, you know, targets you know, that are known to be active in those particular cases. Right? And um, the other aspect that also turns out to be important is when we're able to do the DNA sequencing, it is possible to be able to compare the DNA sequences between any two individuals. So if we look at you know, the DNA, my DNA sequence, and compare that with Bruce, it turns out that only one out of a thousand nucleotides are different between the two of us, right? So the, the number of overall differences between any two individuals are relatively few, right? And, and many of those types of genetic changes are benign, they do not have any effect of them, but the other ones are really very important. Those are the ones, for example, that allow Bruce to be tall and handsome and have a full head of hair, and me, short, ugly, and no hair on the head, right? All of, so it's important to be able to try to figure out, actually, what are these variants that are present in the human population, and how are they important to become who we are? And those types of studies have been done, and there are a lot of studies that have been done and here's an example of those types of studies that have been done in diseases. And here's an example of schizophrenia. And the people who are, have, are diagnosed with schizophrenia, it turns out there are particular types of genetic changes that are present at very high frequency. And uh, so let's spend a little bit of time about rare genetic disorders. And these rare genetic disorders, as I mentioned to you, individually are relatively rare but collectively they actually turn out to be important. And here are the statistics, uh, you know, in, in China, large number of, uh, you know, newborn birds, and as I mentioned to you, nearly 5% of them are known to have a genetic disorders, and there are a total of about 10,000 genetic disorders that have been described. And to be able to identify, you know, those genetic disorders is very important. It's also important, turns out, you know, to be able to, you know, use these kinds of technologies in uh, in vitro fertilization. For couples who are having difficulties in having children, the one of the approaches that they would do is to go through in vitro fertilization clinics. And it turns out, you know, they go through a lot of expense and a lot of time to be able to generate these uh, embryos. You want to be able to have healthy embryos and the way to find out is that it is now possible to be able to take these blastocysts, early stage embryos, and take a single blastomere from that tissue, from that early embryo, and be able to do a genetic test and be able to identify those embryos that are healthy, and only those uh, healthy embryos can be transplanted uh, into the uterus. And as I mentioned to you, uh, women who are over 35, you know, have a higher probability of uh, developing, having children with the chromosomal abnormalities. And one of the ways that you'd be able to do that is to be able to do uh, amniotic uh, fluid testing or chorionic villus sampling of the women. And although both of those methodologies are safe, you know, they're invasive methods to be able to do that. And um, uh, a little over 15 years ago, uh, the technology was developed and it was figured out that uh, moms have a, a little bit of the fetal DNA uh, is circulating in their blood. So it is possible to be able to just to take a small amount of blood from a pregnant mom and be able to sequence that DNA and you would be able to figure out whether or not they have any of these quantum abnormalities. So, I mean, it's, it's very clear that uh, all of the you know, members in the audience, uh, the women, you could ask the question that if you become pregnant and you are given the option whether you want to go through this, what kind of testing, I'm sure that everybody would say, I'd rather have my blood tested rather than going through these invasive procedures. And it turns out certainly, you know, in the United States and throughout the world, the whole uh, area of this kind of prenatal testing is changing and most of the people prefer to use this type of technology. 
And uh, so these, as I mentioned to you, these rare genetic disorders are, are individually rare, but there are large numbers of them. One of them uh, is the cystic fibrosis, you know, and this turns out to be also a very important, most frequent genetic uh, disorder uh, throughout the world, including China. And these are actually all the different types of mutations, you know, that are found in this gene called CFTR. And uh, it actually turns out, you know, the original uh, mapping of this uh, uh, disease gene was done by Lap Chi Sui, who was the president of the uh, Hong Kong University and uh, a remarkable uh, set of achievements at the time when the technologies for being able to do this were very complicated. Any case, so uh, like uh, Bruce talked about, you know, the time that it took to be able to develop the drugs for, you know, for um, CML, it also took a long time to be able to develop the drugs, uh, you know, for these types of disorders such as cystic fibrosis. It was thought that, uh, you know, disorders such as cystic fibrosis with the genetic disorders, one would never be able to find, you know, a cure for, for them. But it actually turns out to be, you know, completely different today. First, after the gene was cloned, it was possible to be able to deduce the sequence and be able to figure out what it does. And it turns out to be, you know, a, a channel uh, a gene. And it was figured out when you were able to look at the protein, you know, what is the, how the channel closes and opens, you know, to be able to get um, ions, you know, through, through the membrane. And it turns out that when, you know, uh, when uh, the mutation is present in this gene, that the folding of the protein is altered. So it, that is the reason, you know, why it turns out the channel is not working. So people began to think about trying to identify uh, drugs, and, uh, and it turned out that a company uh, in, in Boston called Vertex uh, spent a significant amount of time and found a drug that is, is the structure is shown here, and that is actually approved by the Food and Drug Administration to treat patients initially with one particular most common mutation called the Delta 508 mutation. And you could see the, the picture of one of the uh, young boys that has been affected by cystic fibrosis. And on the left-hand side, before he, the drug was available, you could see him you know, really gasping for breath uh, because of uh, the disease. And the same person on the right-hand side uh, after the, you know, the drug was uh, given, administered to him, it's completely normal. And uh, so this uh, drug really changed, uh, you know, the whole the way that you'd be able to treat cystic fibrosis patients. And it turns out this is not the only, you know, genetic disease for which drugs uh, were available. This is another uh, disease, rare genetic disease called Called, uh, among a group of disorders called lysosomal storage disorders, and this disease is the Gaucher's disease. And it turns out that a lysosomal enzyme is mutated, and uh, the precursor for one of the biochemical uh, is accumulating in lysosomes. And it turns out that it is possible to be able to have the enzyme that is capable of converting that as a, or using that as a substrate can be given to patients. And uh, here is, uh, you know, a, a young lady, you know, that has taken this and very become effective. And now, uh, as a result of actually these tremendous successes, virtually every uh, ph pharmaceutical company around the world has a program to be able to develop drugs for these rare genetic disorders and the whole the spectrum of things are changing. So all of this is only possible. First, you gotta be able to recognize what the disease is and then be able to provide them with the right kind of drug. To be able to do that, you need to be able to do the genetic testing. Then uh, another place which turns out to be very important is in cancer susceptibility. Although many cancers you know, are developed spontaneously. There are turns out that certain types of cancers are present in families, 
and uh, individuals who are born with particular types of you know, genetic mutations. In the case of breast cancer, all of you have probably heard of the two genes, BRCA1, breast cancer 1, or breast cancer 2, and uh, mutations you know, in these genes make these women susceptible to develop breast and ovarian cancers before they reach age 50 uh, with a 60 to 70 percent probability. There are other types of things, like colon cancer, you know, there are a number of genes that are known to be involved in susceptibility to these cancers. As I mentioned at the top of the slide, you could see that it is now known that 10 percent of all cancers are the results of genetic predisposition. So it is possible, you know, if a family member had cancer, has been diagnosed with cancer, then it is possible for the individual to be able to get tested for these predisposition genes. And if any of those genes are found to be mutated, that means that that individual would be at a high risk to develop cancer, and we could do something about that. And um, so now we know a large number of these the genes that are known to be involved in cancer predisposition that are distributed uh, you know, throughout the genome, uh, and we know about all of those things. And there are several companies that provide the testing of these 120 genes or so, which are cancer predisposition genes. So uh, it also turns out to be very important in pediatric cancer. And we didn't recognize early, but it turns out a large number of these, uh, you know, pediatric cancers are the results of genetic mutations. So the, you know, overall, if you think about all of these different types of disorders, whether they're rare genetic disorders or these other types of things, you know, the disease-causing genes, you know, are being identified at a very, very rapid rate. And so we'd be able to identify all of these things. So uh, in my own vision about the future, about where things would go, it would be possible for a relatively small amount of money for a newborn to be sequenced with their entire genome. And looking at the entire genome, you ought to be able to determine, you know, what are all the different disorders to which they might be susceptible for or that they have a defect in, and that you'd be able to think about the right kind of treatment for them and keep them healthy. And finally, i just tell you uh, just another aspect of cancer that uh, Bruce alluded to. And um, uh, early in the century that, um, uh, again, the National Cancer Institute you know, started a program to try to identify you know, the genetics and genomics of uh, cancer and started a program called the Cancer Genome Atlas Program to be able to sequence, you know, uh, DNA and examine the RNA and examine the proteins from all of the major cancer types and uh, became an international effort. And, um, and here is an example of the study that uh, Bruce and I were involved with in a non-small cell lung cancer. And um, in, in this particular case, several hundred you know, non-small cell lung cancer tumors have been sequenced for all of the 20,000 genes in the human genome. And there were some remarkable observations that have been made from that. So even though all the 20,000 genes have been sequenced in this tumor, it turns out that, as you could see here, only about 20 to 25 of those 22,000 genes were ever found to be significantly mutated in these tumors. So what it means is that even though there are all these 20,000 genes, the genes that are actually involved and modified in lung cancer are these about 25 to 30 genes. The second thing that's also very important is that uh, on a vertical bar like that bar that you'd be able to see is the one patient. If you look at any one patient, the number of mutations that patient's tumor has are relatively few, maybe four or five of them. And if you look at individuals of those, then you find that you know the most frequent mutation that is present in lung cancers is P53. The second most frequent mutation is KRAS, and so on and so forth. So it is now possible to be able to look at a 
uh, a lung cancer patients and be able to classify that patient on the basis of these types of mutations. And here is an example of how those types of changes and how frequently those are present. And as uh, Bruce uh, pointed out, it turns out that, you know, virtually all of these different categories of uh, patients, you know, we have a drug uh, that has been developed. So it is now possible to be able to, you know, take uh, patients and sequence their tumor DNA in this way and be able to classify them on the basis of not just of the where they came from, what tissue they came from, but what kinds of genetic changes that they have, and then be able to uh, provide treatment decisions. And here is um, uh, uh, emphasizing what uh, Bruce already told you, and I think that as he pointed out, at the beginning, not too long ago, 20 years ago, right, there were no, were no targeted therapies. And, um, and as uh, you know, Bruce was instrumental in bringing the first of these targeted therapies, the EEG for tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and in 2014, there are a few of them. And now in 2023, you could see all of the drugs that are available to be able to treat uh, 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 lung cancer patients. Remarkable types of achievements. And uh, I, Bruce and I talk about this, and he said, you know, he tells me about his own lifetime, but he's treating patients. In a 2001, the people were considered to be hopeless. Now he'd be able to, you know, provide these types of treatments, and many of them are now living in a good, productive lives. The remarkable types of changes, and this is just not true for only, you know, for lung cancer, but virtually for every cancer type. All of these, uh, you know, the ability to be able to treat these uh, are becoming important. New drugs are being uh, developed, understanding the mechanisms, understanding the genetic and genomic changes, are enabling the development of new drugs. Here is just one of, example of them uh, is a PARP inhibitor uh, you know, for, that's been approved now for, uh, you know, women with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, which, you know, and BRCA1 and BRCA2, you know, are involved in uh, double strand break repair that's impaired when they're mutated, and now they go through an alternate pathway called the PARP pathway, and if you can inhibit the PARP, then those cells will die. So these so-called synthetic lethal technologies you know, develop this kind of a new kind of a drug. So how do you use all this uh, information? What do we know about this? So first of all, you know, we now recognize but genetics and environment play a very important role uh, in both common diseases and rare disorders. And the genetic basis for many, many disorders are now understood. And now you can identify people you know, for at risk, you know, for uh, a particular disease, or you'd be able to detect these diseases early using these types of technologies uh, by simply sequencing all of the coding portions of the human genome for a relatively uh, reasonable cost. So you could use these types of technologies to be able to change things everywhere, including China. And I know that, you know, there is a big effort in China to be able to say, we're asking the question, how do you, you know, improve the general population of the health? And how do you improve the efficiency with which hospitals would be able to treat the patients? And these technologies can be able to do that. So I want to conclude by showing that uh, genetics plays a very important role in health and disease. And we can identify the people at risk. And um, now many, as a result of this, many of the diseases that are, you know, known to be incurable are now getting, you know, developing drugs. And um, certainly, you know, as Bruce pointed out, a tremendous difference, you know, at, at, in, in treating uh, cancer patients, certainly at, um, you know, at major uh, cancer centers, uh, such as Dana-Farber, you know, virtually all of the patients' the tumor DNAs are sequenced, you know, and that information is provided to the oncologists for making treatments. So I want to argue 
that implementations of the principles of precision medicine that I talked about can Im improve the quality of healthcare. It's already proven to be the case, and it is within our power to be able to implement these uh, strategies, and that would be able to make lives better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kuchela Tati.